Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the last panel, I believe, for, for this track. Uh, my name is Ron Daniels. Uh, this is Long-Term Advocacy and How to Avoid Burnout. Uh, I'm the moderator today. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists, and then I'm going to turn it over to them largely, and I have some softball questions to get them started. But uh, we, we do love questions from the audience. Uh, we just ask if you would come down. Uh, there's a microphone here in the middle of the aisle that Scott's about to adjust. It's got green tape on it. Uh, please ask your question there. This is being recorded, so we like to, to get the question recorded, too. If we don't get that done, uh, then I have to repeat the question, and it takes up more time, and it's far far less insightful because I, I basically butcher your questions into whatever I want them to be, uh, which is no fun. Uh, the other thing I'll say before I introduce our panelists is to remember to rate uh, this this uh, panel in the DragonCon app. I know it's the last one that you're probably going to, but please do remember to rate it. It's a big help to everybody. And so I'm going to start with Haley. Haley, will you tell us about yourself? Sure. So hi, my name is Haley Tsukayama. I'm senior legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, which is a nonprofit dedicated to advocating for uh, civil liberties in the digital age. Um, I've been at EFF since 2018. Before that, I was in another industry that was very prone to burnout, which was journalism. I was a reporter at the Washington Post uh, for eight years covering technology policy. Um, at EFF, I kind of project manage all of our state level legislation, so I get to deal with 50 state legislatures um, and occasionally DC. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for making this last panel. And then Andrew? Hey everyone, I'm Andrew Greenberg. I've been involved with various uh, advocacy organizations for about 40 years now. Uh, I guess some of the main ones I've been involved with have been looking for sane drug policies. Um, a lot of uh, various justice organizations over the years. Like Haley, I was briefly a reporter before I went into game development. So got out of that quickly and went into another area that's very well known for its burnout, games. <laughs> and, uh, and now I run a nonprofit, the Georgia Game Developers Association. I've been doing that now for 10 years, and I sit on a number of boards where, again, you're a volunteer. So getting to deal with the issues of burnout for volunteers, burnout for board members, burnout for staff, burnout for donors, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's uh, an issue all across uh, the spectrum when you're involved with advocacy. And, and I'm an attorney in, in middle Georgia, and most lawyers get burnt out. So <laughs> that, that's why I'm moderating, I guess. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask both of y'all is, uh, really, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected how you deal with burnout? And whichever one of you wants to go first. All right. Sure. So... Uh on the game side of things, there was a lot more interest in everything we were doing. It sparked some more energy. Uh, but one thing I've noticed, uh, my, vol my organization, we primarily are run with volunteers. A lot of the volunteers have faded away into their own basements and like without those in-person networking events. So folks who might have been getting burned out suddenly lost the social aspect, which was feeding them and help and was one of the primary aspect to counter burnout and uh, i've definitely seen the volunteers the number of volunteers plummet beyond what we've done in the past uh, on the flip side we finally started doing in-person meetings again and the desire for them was so pent up we did one i didn't think would be that heavily attended and well over twice the number of people came out uh to it and a lot of interest again in volunteering but um during that pandemic yeah, we were definitely losing losing folks, and um, I work with a lot of friends. I, I, we do uh, work with refugees, et cetera, through um, uh, New American Pathways and groups like that. And all of these different groups that help folks who are living near the uh, near the bottom rung just were overloaded because they were getting so much need for a call for assistance during the uh, pandemic and of course with the refugee groups we work with suddenly we're having this uh, stream of afghan refugees and we're gearing up uh, and getting right now all the ukrainian refugees and we'll be seeing more of other groups and they are overwhelmed as well so the pandemic pandemic definitely forced greater activism at the same time those volunteer resources were were sorely lacking stretched everyone thinner yeah i think that's a good point i mean i think for me what i really noticed is 
uh, a lot of people kind of notice that we have we have one inner well of energy, right? Pandemic, just living during the pandemic, <laughs> trying to go to the grocery store, trying to figure out how am I going to get masks, what are my kids going to do in school, all these things, right? Kind of depleted that general well. I think activism can be an outlet for people to feel like they're making a difference. And so we did see a lot of people kind of interested in, you know, in doing something, oh, I'm working from home now, maybe I have a little more time to, to do a little bit of work with EFF. But you really had to keep in mind sort of capacity. Um, you know, people, maybe more people would be willing to do something, but maybe they wouldn't be quite as able to do as much, right? So you kind of have to really like balance that and think that through. Um, and then, you know, for the active, for people on staff, for people at EFF, I think, um, you know, trying to navigate how do you do all the things you used to do in person now online. Luckily, EFF was already pretty, well, we're extremely online, as, as is said. But, um, uh, you know, just trying to figure out some of what those logistics look like. Just everything took a little more time. Um, and, yeah, you just had to be really prepared for people to say, I'm sorry, I really wanted to do this, but I got I to gotta tap out. You know, my kid's sick or my mom's sick or something. Yeah, in some ways, we were fortunate that the in-person events went away because the load to get those rolling would have just required a lot more and broken a lot more folks. Mm -hmm. Being able to have them handle things virtually made it more manageable. Mm -hmm. Do, do y'all feel like your your let's say your your regular you know bench that you normally go to of volunteers and people that get involved in your activism uh, ha has having to deal with these capacity issues and perhaps not having as many, you know, extra people, has that affected them? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to lean on your heavy hitters, right? And so that's kind of what I meant when I'm talking about reduced capacity during the pandemic. Um, it's also encouraged us, though, in, in other ways to look for other, so, you know, EFF, you know, we do, we have our issues, and then we work with a lot of people on, on a lot of issues, lots of different organizations. And I think for us, it's also encouraged us to look at especially some of the the, um, the issues that came to light in the pandemic. So, you know, not only did we have a pandemic, but we had the, the George Floyd, you know, back Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. protests. So we had folks who suddenly were wanted to talk about protest security, right? So we got to partner with some organizations that, like, honestly, I wish we had been able to talk to before um, and, you know, kind of work with them. And, and there was a, a greater interest in pooling expertise so that none of us had to start from the beginning, both because we were at reduced capacity and because there were these really urgent issues. And so I think, um, you know, we definitely saw some people fade away, but we also were able to build these other um, these other relationships and kind of pool all of our resources together and kind of say, okay, in this time, you know, we're gonna we're gonna come together and we're gonna try and do some more work. So. Um, yeah, but definitely saw a change in the type of folks who are volunteering. For instance, um, one of the wonderful things about um, drug policy advocacy is that a lot of the volunteers I've noticed through the years have been mothers whose children are finally growing up. Uh, they finally have time, a little bit of time. They're not, the kids aren't adults yet, but they want their kids to live in a world with a saner drug policy and less of these prohibition issues than they dealt with growing up. And so they're suddenly interested in volunteering. Kids are about tweens, they're starting to hit teens. Uh, but suddenly all of these women were being pulled not only out of volunteering, but out of the workforce in order to watch the kids who were suddenly back at home again. So I was hearing this from a number of groups that their volunteer um, recruitment they expected to have just didn't happen. And they would love to have had these people working online, but they were too swamped with everything else. So we did see a change in the volunteer pool. I mean, mine has always been relatively young uh, college age, but for other groups, yeah, real issues finding them. Do y'all feel that not being able to do as much in person, having constraints on that, is helps prevent burnout in some levels, or is it about the same? I mean, I know you deal with fifty different states. You, you've got, <laughs> got different one. issues, but one state. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I know, for instance, you know, when when we start to do things here in Georgia, we go down to the state house, we right. we lobby, you know, directly to the reps yep. and the senators. And, but you couldn't do that for a while. Right, 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 right. Though uh, they were still having meetings in private if you're bringing a check. So uh, uh, you could still you could still lobby, but the classic citizen lobbying was definitely not what it was. Uh, 2020, I mean, it kicked in. So after the session, basically COVID shutdown happened at the uh, end of the 2020 legislative session here in Georgia. So we did have a lot of uh, involvement with them leading up to it. 
then it shuts down. And for the summer, you usually be meeting with them. That didn't happen. End of year, uh, uh, there were elections coming up. So suddenly they were looking for money and, and votes and trying to figure out how to do it as best they can. So suddenly they were opening and talking however they could. And then we got into 2021 lockdown again. And again, it became problematic. Dealing with them was very difficult going down to the legislature in 2020. I watched almost... I went down only a handful of times, whereas usually I'm down legislature, yeah, several dozen times. And most of the time I was watching on Zoom, because thankfully the committee meetings were, were finally there. But um, for, ad, for many people in advocacy, it is that social connection that really does feed them throughout. It's a meeting with this peer group of like-minded people who are enthusiastic, and you've had a long day of knocking on doors, trying to raise money, trying to get people active, trying to get an event happening, and you're burned out. And suddenly you're hanging out with the exact same people with the same passion, and it refires you, and you're recharged up. And yes, you can kind of do that on Zoom, but it is not the same thing as doing in person. How many people in here do advocacy work of any, of any type? Excellent, excellent. And how many people are, are involved in a group of more than one person doing it? Yeah, that's, it's almost always the case. You are so much better off doing it as a group that can continue to lift you up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's, I feel like all my answers are like, well, in some ways, in some ways. So, you know, certainly doing multi-state work, I was able to see people's faces that I had only ever heard on the phone or, you know, whatever, or participate in hearings and you know, I could participate in a hearing in Massachusetts in the morning and do one in Alaska in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, so that's cool because then I'm not like flying all <laughs> around. But um, definitely for things like, you know, the the grunt work of advocacy, the logistics, the, you know, get education, getting people on the same page, you have to be, we had to be really thoughtful about, okay, maybe in the past we would have done everybody come in and we'll we'll spend all day. And it's like, maybe we'll do two shorter three shorter zoom sessions because people have been on teleconference all day and then you know they're they they're coming to you because they're fired up they want to do something but you also don't want to like add another two hours Zoom meeting to the mm -hmm. end of their day <laughs> um and that uh you know that that's another thing that we had to think about a lot and i'll say this about zoom meetings for me and for a lot a number of other people i mean a, a meeting in person can drain you but there's also something fulfilling about it if the meeting hits its accomplishments it hits its goals a Zoom meeting, I don't care if we've hit it stuff. I'm drained. Mm -hmm. And especially after Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, I can pop from in-person meeting to in-person meeting, and there's stuff about those meetings that will fire me up. But Zoom meetings, just brain wants to turn off. Yeah. It's like if I have to look at the screen for another 20 minutes, I will I will scream. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Video off. <laughs> you, you both have had, you know, you know, good good bit of experience doing this. You obviously have the most of anybody up here, but uh, wh what do you think has been so helpful to sustain your ability to remain involved in these types of things? Um, number one is celebrating the small victories because they're always small victories. And it's easy to say I didn't get the whole what I wanted, but uh, certainly, especially on the legislative side, I wanted a program made better, but I kept it going. It didn't get killed. I'm very happy with that. I'd love to have improved it, but it didn't die. I, I'm involved with the entertainment industry here. There was uh, efforts to build the post-production industry. That bill we had in place at sunset. I was very sad about that because I helped get the original bill passed to get post-production growing here. But we've got a chance to raise it back up. It's just the fact that we can bring it back. We've got folks who will reintroduce it. Minor victories. The thing might not pass again, but I've got uh, legislators who are willing to introduce it. So... For me, it's definitely every minor victory. Very glad to to celebrate that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And like, you know, think about the <laughs> the silver linings in your losses too, mm -hmm. right? I think um, I always joke that you know it's like the prizes is, is the friends we made along the way. Like, I actually <laughs> sincerely believe that in advocacy. Like, even if you fight alongside someone, you know, all year and you lose, it's like, well, we've built this friendship. Mm -hmm. We've had this conversation. We've brought it into the open. We've, um, you know, built a coalition. We've made some momentum. And so for me, it's really like finding other people and like learning about how their inter issues intersect with our issues. And, you know, again, how we can lift each other up like that is really honestly what keeps me going day to day. Um, you can imagine, you know, you lose a lot more bill fights than you win, I think. Mm -hmm. On average, if I was focused entirely on my batting average, I would be very depressed all the time. Um, but I love, you know, being able to talk to people all across the country who are like fired up about um, 
digital civil liberties um, and like, you know, just being able to say, oh, well, if I ever have, if I ever get stuck on a layover in, you know, in Tennessee, I could probably call this person and get lunch or, you know, something like that. Like that, that means a lot to me. And, you know, we'd have a good conversation because we've been talking about these issues. And what Haley's bringing up is an important point about why burnout is so dangerous. We need folks in there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. We're not these billion dollar dark money organizations that, uh, where the leads are getting seven figure annual salaries and even their assistants are getting six figure salary. We just saw another $1.6 billion dark money organization, uh, created. So, uh, you do have to keep folks in for the long haul, not at seven figure salaries. So, uh, did we have to find those ways to combat, combat exactly that level of burnout in drug policy? I mean, this has been normal. It's been around since uh, basically in one form since the 60s and in its current form since the 70s, 50 years. And there's still drug prohibition is, is the norm, not the exception. But, man, every little victory is so important uh, for the folks involved with that. Yeah. I think another thing I would say is um, I, do, I do this for myself and I also do this for when I'm you know trying to find people and give them tasks is like really try and figure out what um, – what you enjoy doing and how to apply that to the advocacy. So like, I like writing, I was a journalist. Um, that's how I deal with my anger when I lose. I write an angry blog post. Um, my colleagues call it my Sith writing. They really like it when I Sith write a blog post and let the hate flow through me. Um, uh, and you know, that's how that's how I like to do it. Not everybody likes to write, right? But people like, um, you know, some people are extroverts. They like making those calls. Some people like the logistics. They they love the spreadsheets. You know, so it's like really finding those spots where um, you can use your passion and like fill yourself up, right? Like if I have to meet face to face with a lot of people every day, that depletes my batteries. It doesn't charge me up. So I can do it, but it's not something that I necessarily would want always to be my task. If you ask me to write up the educational materials for legislators, I will happily run in that direction. <laughs> What's the biggest thing y'all have done or seen others do to actually help your volunteers you know, keep keep up that momentum, sustain themselves? I'm actually going to use Dragon Con as an example of what's coming up today. I think the Dead Dog Party has been a Dragon Con, and it's been a tradition of a lot of other cons there. The volunteers basically get thrown all the food and leftover booze. It's in everybody's room and from the con suite. And everybody, we were joking that this panel – the burnout panel is the last panel of Dragon Con when we're all burned out anyway. <laughs> but the volunteers still got to break all this shit down. Yeah. They're still going to be working here for quite a bit longer. And uh, then that dead dog party, I think, is a wonderful final uh, frenzy when you're at your most exhausted to just take it up a notch and you leave with the memories of that dead dog party is the thing that is freshest in your mind, even though you are so exhausted at that point so again it is that celebration no matter what happened no matter how much equipment broke no matter if the hilton pipes flooded off everyone's electronic <laughs> equipment and cameras uh there is this one last moment of of brilliance in it and i've liked this I've, when campaigns have done it successful not had that one last blowout of some type uh to bring everyone back together i think that helps recommit everyone to coming back mm -hmm. And even on something not like centered as an event or, you know, but if at the end of a long session, I think, you know, yeah, having the appreciation, having them the postmortem, if you want, like a blameless postmortem of like, uh, you know, if things, if we'd had more people, maybe we could have done this or whatever, but like not to get mired in that, just be like, look at what we accomplished, look at we, what we could do next time um, together. Uh, and just really thanking everyone for their time is, is so important. You know, every meeting I take, I try to just at least shoot off a little thank you email because... It matters. Right, right. And this is a great way to, to combat burnout across all the different spectrums. You bring your donors out to the volunteer party. You see the volunteers fire up. That fires up the donors to continue uh, their support. Then the staff, of course, who threw that party. They'll need a party afterwards to <laughs> recover from this party. But uh, crossing those groups together is a great way to re-energize everybody. Yeah, that's a great point. That's great. And we've had a couple of folks come in the, the back of the room since we started uh, if anybody has any questions at any point in time, come on down. There's not – nobody's going to get mad that you interrupt a question or anything like that. Just come on down to the microphone, ask the question. Um, you've both talked about your, your volunteer – well, we have a question. We'll save mine and let, let, let one from the audience come on. 
Uh, well, good morning, first of all. Morning. Often, uh, you know, morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, you are at Dragon Con where 2.30 or 3 o'clock is in the morning. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was wondering, like, for, for all of y'all up there, when did you reach your lowest point and how did you recover from it? Ooh. That's a great question. Yeah, there have been, there've been a number. I mean, certainly, uh, again, in, in drug policy issues, I mean, it has been such a beating the head against the wall. I mean, it's so clear we need sanity in these discussions. But uh, so, so often the answer is no, 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 no. We're not going to be saying about this. We'll keep, we see all the horrors going on with it, and we're just going to double down on those horrors. Um, it can be it can be mind boggling, and uh, even in uh, the the game dev side, where we advocate for the game industry. There are times when it's like just ready to be making games rather than advocating them, I and mean, that's what I'd rather be doing anyway. But I found that it's very critical that someone be in the role to actually um, to actually be a face for the industry and present it out to other folks and help the industry grow successfully and not in crazy and often self destructive spurts. Um, it, it, I do often step back and go into other areas, and thankfully a lot of those are other areas of advocacy, and that helps freshen me back up and bring ideas from what I'm doing over here back to what I was doing over there. And just having some of those successes is a great way uh, to, to come back to it. We are in places where we get a great deal of praise. I know EFF gets praised all the time because they're all doing awesome things, but of course there's also a lot of criticism out there too. So we appreciate the praise that comes from others, but it really is seeing the effects of our work more than anything else that, that brings that spark back in, at least for me. Yeah, yeah, and I think, that's, I think that's true. I mean, especially when I think about burnout, right? It's like the conditions that cause burnout is you feel like you've lost control. You know, you're doing a lot of work and you don't have really any control over the outcome. So um, <laughs> I would say probably in general, the lowest point for me for burnout, um, what I did was I changed careers from journalism to advocacy because I was really sick of writing all these stories about these companies doing these things and then not being able to have an opinion about it. Um, so they, I went in to yell for a living instead. Um, so that's one thing. That was a big thing I did. In terms of, you know, at, while, while I've been an advocate, I think, um, you know, this year was actually kind of tough. We had two bills that we were really excited about. We sponsored. We went through the California legislature, and we just hit a buzzsaw. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> Um, you know, they got they died pretty early in the session um, in a committee that is particularly secretive. Um, no open hearings in that in that in that committee, um, and that was really tough. And I think for me, um, what helped me through that was actually you know finding as I said we we do a lot of coalition work, especially in the in the state legislative team, and finding other people who'd been through it before who I could talk to. Uh, you know, just sometimes just to vent but then also to kind of figure out okay well how did you get how did you get your bill through appropriations last year right like finding out those strategies and kind of thinking like okay you know honestly the, this is where I could have done better this is where you know this is where I did something great and it just didn't work um, just being able to talk through people with that experience and again having those communities to lean on I think that is really what what pulled me out of it um, and then I found something else to be mad about <laughs> And I'll throw out another example. I mean, for 20 years now, I've been doing the How Not to Go to Jail panel here. So we started with the movie Busted, done a number of other movies. Now it's the 10 Rules of Dealing with Police Encounters. So I've been doing this uh, since the late 90s with George Normal, and then EFF track thankfully picked that up here. Scott, is it? It's been more than 20 years now, hasn't it? Didn't we start at 2001 or 2002 with it? Uh, well, it started in 99. So. Right. Uh, anyway, about 20 years, but then we suddenly had all of the very public examples of how bad police encounters could be, and that got really depressing. And I mean, I know not everybody's watching these videos I'm showing, but uh, just the idea that we're talking about how bad it can be, and then there are deaths and horrible beatings associated with police encounters, it's like, this is just going to get worse and worse and worse. I mean, how is this going to stop? Um, and it was great to do this session here and to show the movies elsewhere, but you real fe really feel like you're not even a finger in a, in a dike about to blow up. You're, you're, you're watching the water gush around you, and you've got a spoon to try and deal with it. But then all the movements spring up to deal with the, the issues that we're dealing with. How do you uh, 
getting sanity into encounters with the police. So it did go from the, wow, is this ever going to improve to, yeah, yeah, it's actually improving. And I think that's important to remember, too. Like, a lot of times with advocacy, you feel like you make no progress, you make no progress. But progress happens, like, slowly and then quickly, right? So it's like, if you are able to go back and get your, your get your face known, get people know who you are, know that you have this expertise, like, when they're ready to deal with that issue, it will move. So it's just a matter of, you know, being willing to put in the time and then, re you know, remembering, like, sometimes educating people is the goal, right? Talking about right. small victories, right? Like, educating people is the goal of, of the advocacy. So even if you don't necessarily get a bill to move in your direction, like, you are building these relationships over time with legislators, with staff, with uh, with other lobbyists. So, like, that's that's important, too. That's probably more answer than you wanted. No. Actually, actually, that was, like, a great lead. And as you guys, as y'all were talking, it, was, it generated another question. Um, actually, probably like two questions. <laughs> Bring them. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess the first one is, what was your worst year for advocacy and why? <laughs> and then the second question, well, well, let's go with the first one for now. <laughs> worst year. Well, I've only been doing this three years and change. So, <laughs> um, I mean, pandemic year was hard. I think, um, you know, 2020, it, like just watching watching my colleagues, you know, a lot of issues came up, right? And so sometimes I, I believe very firmly that what I do is important, but you know, it was like, how important is it on the scale of all this other stuff that's happening? Um, it was very difficult to kind of like go through it. I, you know, I did a lot of, the, a common solution for burnout, they say, is self-care, right? I did a lot of thinking um, about, you know, kind of where it all fits in the scheme of things, but, um, and then finding ways where I could help with those bigger problems, like, right? So like we did a, a lot of work. I talked earlier about protests, so like helping people figure out security for protests, um, you know, in light even recently of the of the Dobbs ruling, right? Figuring out how to protect people's um, health information, right? Whether that's mental health information or, um, or uh, sexual health and reproductive health information. So really just trying to figure out, okay, I mean, I'm lucky in that our issue advocacy area, everything touches the internet. So, um, but really figuring out where our issues can plug into these ongoing conversations, that's really what's, what's helped me, I think. Yeah, this year wasn't a good year for me legislatively. I went in with hopes of improving the uh, whole entertainment uh, investment act here in Georgia and ended up just basically trying to salvage the game credit and make sure it didn't go away and that was an interesting fight in and of itself with interesting things being said uh, and of course the post-production program disappeared uh, in its entirety now we got to have it reintroduced but uh, it means there's a chance to educate legislators more and members of the public and uh, show the value of these industries to the state and keep moving forward so okay thanks you just mentioned something about the you're talking about the film industry right and can you talk a little bit more about the, what you were advocating for that got dropped? So uh, one of the things that uh, I do as a volunteer is I chair the DeKalb County Entertainment uh, Commission. And, of course, I, as a job, I uh, am the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. So both of these are covered under the Entertainment Investment Act here in Georgia. Um, we know about the big film credit, but uh, video game credit, we're trying to build a video game industry here because video game industry is bigger than Hollywood. It's going on to a 200 billion year wide industry. We want that to be in Georgia. It is the medium of the 21st century. Um, but the, uh, the cap on it is you've got the film credit. We all know it's a billion dollars in film credits and more going through the state. But for games, it's 12.5 million. So a much smaller program. Uh, a lot of companies can't use it. It was not, hasn't been effective at, at bringing in other studios here. So try to Im improve that. Basically, we're lucky to keep the program running. For post-production, we brought in something because, frankly, we think that that long list of names at the end of a movie, all those folks working for Digital Light Magic uh, and Beast and et cetera, who are getting the $100,000 a year jobs and are permanent positions, not transitory, or exactly the kind of positions we want Georgians to have. So we were applying a very similar program to post-production, because right now that's not really covered. So unfortunately, that program got sunset. We got it to the last day as legislature, before the Senate. We just needed one more vote to pass, and just got uh, held up and didn't go through. So uh, we, what we really think that post-production is 
not just for games and film, but for every kind of media, going to be absolutely key for the next 20 and 30 years. And having those jobs in Georgia will make this a media hub par excellence. And seeing that die means that a lot less folks will be here and will be elsewhere. Okay. Well, thanks for your responses. And then I guess my last question for now is, what do you see as being the future campaigns that you would put forward like in the next three to five years based on what has happened over the last six years? Well, the other thing I didn't mention was that I'm not as active in drug policy as I used to be, but obviously we've been working in Georgia to try and get something moving. And that's been an interesting thing where we've been trying, where we passed medical, or a form of medical, and nobody's been able to get the licenses to grow because that's all been held up in court. So seeing that get shaked out, uh, sh seeing that shake out and get fixed, and hopefully seeing the licenses go is an interesting, immediate fight to uh, to at least get us moving somewhat uh, forward toward a more sane uh, environment. Um. So I mean, we'll have, we'll have a bunch we'll have a bunch of things rolling. I think for us, you know, we um, based on so I'm trying to think. So the next three five years, based on a lot, um, you know, we've done a lot on um, on sort of uh, looking at how information flows to law enforcement um, in the light of you know in light of a, a lot of concern about police uh, conduct. So that's a thing that we're working on at the state level. Um, biometric information protections, another thing we're work looking at working on uh, at the state level, uh, right to repair legislation, right, so saying that you should be able to fix your own devices. We've had some really good wins uh, in New York State, particularly, and also in, um, my brain is not, I think it was Idaho, but anyway, we've had a couple of good wins on that, and so I think there's a lot of momentum. You know, it, the funny thing about advocacy is it is all, it, it moves in waves, right, so it is all about momentum and kind of trying to figure out, okay, um, where on our issues is it worth to to put the the uh, the effort right now? So those are a couple of places. Um, of course, it's I have no crystal ball, so it's a little hard to to be exact. But um, you know, kind of getting around to the the burnout question, like those are where I think we see a lot of energy right now, and where we see a lot of people motivated to to pitch in. Um, and so you know, it, it'll be a lot of work, but those are the places where I think people are willing to do it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey there. Hello. Um, hello. So I know in talking a lot about burnout, we also talk about, you know, regaining momentum or finding that spark. And so I wanted to know what was your spark moment when you first started? Um, and how did you, and at what point after that did you realize that you were kind of in for a penny, in for a pound, and ultimately make it your career? as opposed to just, you know, that initial getting your feet wet? Well, my favorite was uh, in college, involved in a number of different uh, activities. This, I'm, I'm a little old, so this was uh, uh, Nicaragua, this was apartheid, things like that. And going to college in the late 80s, from 86 to 90, get to college and we're starting to put up uh, tents on the lawn, remind people that apartheid trying to force the university to, vet, to divest from South Africa. And in 86, that seems like a pipe dream. Nothing's gonna move, nothing's gonna happen. By 90, when I'm graduating, things are actually happening. And this is an international movement and all eyes are on it. And as uh, we progress, suddenly apartheid's gone. And Mandela's president of South Africa, <laughs> seeing a victory at that level where I got involved, you know, this is something I should be involved with and maybe we'll make people aware and suddenly changes uh, of an incredible magnitude kick in it is absolutely thrilling. I mean, I'm not even a small cog in that. I'm not even a cog or a tooth in that. I'm, <laughs> I'm a kid going to demonstrations and the like. But uh, seeing that success, you see what everybody did. And that was not a well-funded movement. That was a movement with a lot of big money against it, and uh, it pulled it off. So seeing that success when I didn't think it could happen was just, yeah, this is really possible. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So it's about s s the spark. What's the spark? Um, so I, I referenced earlier that I you know, had been a journalist. Um, I've been getting a lot of stories that I wanted to write that I thought were important, them telling me, you know, well, maybe we don't really want to do that. I used to do product reviews, and um, I always wrote a lot about the privacy of the devices, and that 
mysteriously got taken out of a lot of my stories because <laughs> I guess people didn't want them in reviews. That's my bad. Um, but I, you know, and then I would get reader emails. I think that was like a, a big thing for me. It was like, well, what should be done? What should be done? You know, I'm a parent. Um, you know, what should I be doing for my kid? You know, I, this happened to me. What should what should be done? And you know, that's not really. Um, that, those were questions I wanted to answer and that I didn't feel comfortable answering in my current role, right? As a journalist, you are supposed to, you're not really supposed to talk about the shits, you're supposed to talk about the, the is. Um, and so uh, eventually enough of those built up in my heart that um, I was actually I was on Twitter and I saw the job for the legislative activist posting and I thought, well, I could have opinions for a living. Um, I agree a lot with what that organization is saying and um, you know, kind of all of those questions that I've been holding back and wanting to answer, I thought, well, I could, I could maybe make it through some of that backlog. So that's that's how I got into what I do. So the, you know, my entire profession as attorney is based on advocating for something. Mm -hmm. um, in, in one thing we've done in recent years has been far more insistent and aggressive about addressing mental health, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't think we could have a discussion about this issue without saying what, what are the mental health, mental wellness concerns you see in your volunteers and your colleagues that need to be addressed and how, how, how do your organizations, how do you address them? And then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I guess for me it's, you know, when you're taking on big problems as you often are in advocacy, uh, you know, this is also where Small Victories comes in, right? Because it can be so tempting to just be like, well, if I just work more, then the problem <laughs> will go away faster. Um, and that's not true. I mean, maybe, no, it's not true. Um, and it's, you know, it's very important, I think, to, I really look at my colleagues, right, if I'm, um, because often I'm the point of contact on a bill, so I'm like asking other people to do me favors uh, to, to help me do my work. And I am kind of keeping an eye out on, okay, is it the right time to ask them to do that work? Is there somebody else who can do that work? Are there things they should be thinking about in their lives? You know, are they women? Are they people of color? Are there things that, are there issues that I should be thinking about in terms of, you know, what may burn them out more quickly? Um, what are those tasks? So that's that's like a thing that, that I think about a lot in terms of mental health. It's like, <sighs> People in advocacy are so great. Most of them will do whatever you ask them to do. So it's like really guarding those asks um, and making sure that um, you're not, you know, people will say yes. And so it's really just kind of figuring out like, you know, what are what are they reasonably able to do? Same with myself, right? It's like, I would really like to write four more letters today, but okay, like what is it really going to make a difference if I get it in today versus tomorrow and um, thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, also remembering to eat and remembering that my colleagues need to eat is a, is a big one. So I've been fortunate that uh, it's actually been my volunteers who brought this to me and brought solutions to me because so I didn't have any good ideas on addressing it. Um, obviously, uh, in game development, the Georgia Gameville Association, we've got a folks who are not neurotypical, who are neurodivergent, and they came to me with wanting to present panels on what it means to be neurodivergent in the game industry. Mm -hmm. So we got them up online, great conversations and the like. Um, I was amazed, and this is pre-pandemic, I had a, met with a number of young game devs who were all dealing with the depression at the same time. The point where I started thinking about making a subchapter within the association, just focusing on depression and game development. They didn't want that. That would be too public for them. But having this loose informal network where they reached out to each other really helped all of them. Uh, and it was, um, as an executive director, I'm, I'm used to the idea of I will create this thing and people will come to it and it will do them good. And in this case, I had to not do that and let them find the solutions between each other rather than me slapping something down on them. So um, in my role, I've been very fortunate that they've come to me and I, it, it's taught me I need to listen to them more about what their needs are rather than think I've got a solution that can, I can throw at them. I mean, I've got things like I've got mental health apps that I've got my members free access to and things like that, but uh, they usually come with the better solutions every time. Yeah, and I think carving out that space is really important too. So as you were saying, like making sure that there are those spaces that people can share the, like, I have, I'm in a private Slack room at work where we just talk about men who interrupt us in meetings. Uh -huh. And like, that's just they do a, that? <laughs> <laughs> I should have kept talking so that you could interrupt. What? <laughs> um, not at EFF, I hasten to add, uh, external meetings. Um, but it, just a place to talk about that and, you know, then joke about it. And, and you know, that helps a lot too. 
I've got a friend of mine up in uh, Asheville, uh, uh, Byron uh, Ballard, who is uh, an activist and uh, an advocate for religious freedom. And one of the things that she reiterates uh, a few times a year is is to uh, her, her pick three uh, method. Um, you know, pick three things to be involved with, uh, and then get involved with them. And then later on, what she says, you, you need to go through there and reassess them. Uh, you know, whether or not you're really working on all three, whether you need to be switching over to something else. Uh, but but to to organize your 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 activism. Uh, in that, and and even to the needs that you have, uh, uh, I used to go to like lots of different protests, but it just, you know, physically, I I, I can't run away from things <laughs> if I need to, and sometimes you need to do that at a protest, sure. right? Uh, so I I kind of stopped doing that that kind of thing, and my mind is not as as, as quick as it was back, you know, fifteen years ago. Uh, so I've been limiting a lot of my, my my stuff now to what people will come up and ask me if I'd like to get involved with that, you know, postcard uh, uh, campaigns for, you know, elections and stuff like that. So I, I just wanted to point out that, that, that pick three method that she advocates, and, and uh, it seems to be a really good one for me. That way I can still know that I'm doing something uh, without getting burned out on, on and so that's a method, and I was wondering if you got any other methods. So that ties closely to the just say no thank you, which <laughs> unfortunately in advocacy you learn you have to do because, boy, do you want to take on all of them. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly, and that is, that is the burnout. So it is look at those. And um, also look at what, the, what success actually is. What would success on this be? Yes, grand success would be exactly the thing I want. But what is the success? Not seeing what something that uh, thankfully is there get killed. That's a success, if not a grand success. So I think those go together. When you pick three, what do I actually want to achieve with these three? And sometimes it's just awareness. I'm just making people aware. I might not win, but folks are aware, and that in itself is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, so I I am a, I love lists. So I am a person who who likes lists. I mean, I, I do think it depends a little bit on on who you are. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to see a fellow list maker. Um, but I do think, yeah, to me, being organized actually helps me a lot, right? So not only thinking about priorities, but then also, you know, I mean, parts of the job I like and parts that I don't. Like if I have documentation for other people to do it, that's like another good thing, right? So it's like maybe if I have a goal, um, and it's like breaking down into into subcomponent parts, and you know what. What do I need to do? What can I give to other people? I think that's also really important. And just kind of knowing yourself and how what will motivate you and how you can um, how you move through a task is like really important. So I'm really glad that you found a method that works for you. And knowing yourself is a great point because one of the issues is just identifying burnout both in other people yeah. and in yourself. What does that look like? Um, It's not just, oh, do I want to do this? Yeah, okay. It's, okay, I'm going to put off this call. I'm going to put off this call. I'm not going to reach out to that person. I'm not going to reach out to that person. Oh, the day passed and I didn't do it. And and knowing how you change. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And for me as the executive director, i got to watch out for that in folks around me. If I suddenly see something slipping, is it because there's something happening in that person's life? Is it because whatever I give them isn't accomplishable? Or is it just that they are burned out? Yeah. So I have to keep an eye on other folks all along. And when you're involved with an organization, if you're not in charge, it is good for you to be keeping that eye open. Is there something going on? Someone else is supposed to be doing something uh, with me in this committee. It's not happening. Why is that? How can I support them and, and make things happen? Yeah. So we're going to presuppose that most everybody in the room is involved in some level of activism, activist but but. You know, how, how can people get more involved while not being burnt out or conversely or not necessarily conversely but how can they get involved just from a starting point without burning out um, let's see I mean, I, I did joke earlier about uh, letting the hate flow through me but I actually think uh, if you can find find work to do on issues that you care about care about that care about 
Got, sorry, got very Minnesotan there for a second. Care about that spark joy rather than hate, right? So, um, as a as your motivation, right? So trying to figure out the the ways that you want to engage on issues that make you happy. So, um, in addition to the work I do at EFF during the pandemic, I was really worried about my neighbors with food insecurity. So, I found a food insecurity charity, and I uh, I make referencing my earlier list uh, issue, I, I make their spreadsheets for their logistics to, to do their deliveries. So that was a thing that um, made me feel like I was helping a problem that I cared about in a way that I could do it. I couldn't do the delivery drive, dr uh, the delivery drives, but I could help them do the logistics on that. So I think, um, yeah, finding those, finding those places and then finding the rules that, that fit what you can do. And managing your own expectations. I mean, this is certainly something I would see in, in drug policy. Folks who come in, they're determined they've got the ideas on how this will become better and how we'll suddenly get uh, real drug policy and not this craziness we have in place. And they're going to be the ones to make it happen, and it'll happen this year. Uh, and literally have seen that. And it's like, oh, I want you to stay active, but uh, that, that you're going to be very unhappy very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, again, going back to your knowing yourself issue, I mean, know your mental swings. I've seen people who are really effective on one side of their bipolar and then horribly ineffective and self-doubting and self-defeating on the other side of their bipolar. But you want to keep them involved because they can be really effective. So me knowing them and them knowing themselves, okay, I'm, i got to take mental health out of this. I'm gone for a while. Uh, and then I'll be back when I've got my act together again. That that's critical for it. So yeah, knowing what you want to do, but also what your ability to contribute is, I think are both key to successful long long term. Actually, I had another question, um, and this one was kind of inspired by Ron, because um, I know you mentioned that you're an attorney. So I, I'm a professional, or rather, sorry, I'm a registered nurse. Um, medical professional. Um, and so my question is more along the lines of how do you reconcile um, your activism when it doesn't necessarily align with maybe what your professional image may be and, and sort of navigating those concerns? I have merged one, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear a lot of hats. I, I wear <laughs> a lot of hats um, in all these cases. I'm just, I'm working to make specifically Georgia a better place, but uh, I like to think life in general, and they can be many different ways. Um, again, I mean, you, I mean, your day job, you are obviously accomplishing a lot of good things. So that can keep you buoyed even when other areas that you're trying to work on aren't. Um, seeing the, I, I like the successes that I see in one area when another area isn't really moving forward. And I don't, I try not to beat myself up about the fact, well, maybe if I devoted more energy here instead of there, we'd see more. So um, I think that can work really effectively. I mean, I, I, I'll chime in since I sort of spawned the question, but I mean, I, I, I get involved in so many things. I mean, I'm the president of the Young Lawyers Division for the entire state of Georgia right now. Um, and it takes up a lot of my time and I can't do some of the things that I would normally do because I am in that role but it's important to be in those type of roles uh, and, and to take on leadership positions sometimes that may take you away from advocating for things um, but you know it, it it's it's sort of like you can have more than one hat I mean I can I can go back to my car not to my room right now and swap hats and, and it's just sort of the same thing I mean it, it yeah, that's how it works. But I, I do thank you for what you do as registered nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so important. Um, we probably got time for about two more questions. If anybody's got questions, or I could throw some more softballs. Okay. Uh, good luck to y'all. <laughs> softballs. Um, what What do y'all envision advocacy becoming in the next five years in terms of, of burnout? What What problems do you see on the horizon for your volunteers and colleagues? It, I mean, we both have a lot of younger folks involved with what we do, and just hearing the issues kids are having with the past two years is, is crazy. And talking to teachers and DeKalb County, we work very closely with the schools, hearing what they're seeing now compared to what they were seeing pre-pandemic is worrisome. So these are the kids who are going to come in and be freshmen pretty soon and want to volunteer, we hope, uh, and we're there's the worry that maybe they're not going to want to volunteer. Maybe they're going to be 
becoming more insular, more locked down, more afraid of doing uh, and uh, not sure they can accomplish. So uh, I think for a lot of organizations, there is going to be a need to focus on, uh, and they're not a lost generation, but the COVID uh, generation, uh, to help bring them in, mentor them to being effective volunteers and effective in a lot of different ways that they might not be ready for, to help them with their socialization. And uh, we always get young volunteers who are ready and active and want to do, and I worry that that will be changing over the next five years. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great question, and I'm trying to think through it. I mean, I think what I see a lot is that there is a there's less of a desire to compartmentalize oneself, right? That you, if you're working on an issue, you work on it with, you know, I work on my issues I, I, as, a, as a person who cares about internet freedom. I also work on them as a woman. I work on them as an Asian woman. Like, you know, you bring more of your identity to the, to the advocacy work you're doing and sort of to make space for those sort of intersections, I think is really important for us to be thinking about in the next you know, in the next five, well, if we should have been thinking about it beforehand, but, but it will be important to think about it in the next five years. And then also, you know, again, like having a plurality of roles, different ways for people to plug in, you know, there is a very like kind of stereotypical toolkit that I might hand someone, but really just trying to think about, okay, like, where are they? What can they do? Where are they in their life? Um, you know, what are the other things that they're thinking about? Like, what are the tasks that I can split up or do differently or um, parcel out in a different way that, you know, kind of meets people where they are a little more? So if you work for a nonprofit, and I work for a nonprofit, and yet I do advocacy stuff. And the greatest stressor for me are other members who work in my nonprofit saying, oh, you're doing advocacy work that will reflect on our nonprofit. And that is stressful. Uh, thoughts about how to mitigate the stress from that? You should have been at our code of conduct uh, panel uh, the other day. <laughs> we were specifically talking about uh, codes of conduct, what can and can't be said, et cetera. So um, the nonprofits that I work with, and they go from the George Gainville Association to Cab Entertainment Commission, et cetera, I don't have limits on what I can say, but I have to be constantly mindful that I will be seen as speaking as a representative of that organization when I'm in this event. So I do want to make sure that what I'm saying is an appropriate reflection thereof. Uh, and if you're an employee of it, there might, might very well be something in your code of conduct about it. Uh, on the other hand, most, non most nonprofits will make it clear that what you say not as a representative of that association is fine and dandy, as long as you're very clear. This is my personal Twitter and my personal opinions. Some, no, you can't say whatever, and depending on your role, you might not be able to, to truly speak your mind. And if you're in government, well, then you've really got limitations on a teacher isn't going to be able to campaign for people, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the idea that if you're in a nonprofit, you can't advocate uh, because of the effect on the organization is, is generally not something that the organization's rules will reflect. And um, if they don't like your advocacy in one way or another, it's probably something other than how it reflects on the organization, unless you are reflecting uh, or advocating for something particularly counter to the organization's goals. In my roles as board members as various organizations, they want me to be involved in organizations because one of the main things I bring as a board member is my connections to all these other groups. And the only way to be involved with all these other groups is to be advocating for what they're doing too, even if it's different from what this other organization is. So in most cases, that is what you're doing is desirable. Um, so I, I'd be rather surprised. I mean, that is that can be seen as increasing your value to the organization. Yeah, I mean, so I'm more. I've thought about this more when I was a reporter, right? Because I think, um, particularly, again, because you're supposed to be unbiased and um, and fact based. That uh, you know, I would, especially when I lived in D.C., there were definitely protests I did not attend, right? Um, because I didn't want to be seen in public as a, you know, there are a lot of uh, organizations that would have loved to say post reporter attends X protest, right? Um, and so I was more careful, you know, the way that I. Um, that I dealt with that is, you know, I, I would find 
less visible ways to support causes that I was interested in. Um, or I'd find, you know, uh, ways to talk to friends who were involved in those causes and figure out, you know, how I could, how I could support them. Um, you know, I, I do understand, like, that can be a very difficult position to be in, but I think, um, again, knowing, knowing how it's going to play off in your, in your own organization is important. And then just kind of finding ways, you know, it's, it's like water, right? There are always ways to flow into, into doing the work. So, um, just trying to find those avenues. I'll give you my specific example. I mean, it is well known that I was involved in working for sane drug policy before I took over the Game Development Association. And that actually made me more effective because I was already used to dealing with legislators on a regular basis, talking about these issues and understanding how the system worked and the like. And uh, there's, it's not, they're different focus, but they're not necessarily a conflict. So being good at one and maybe better at the other as well. We've got about two minutes left, so I'm going to kind of give you a couple of rapid fire questions to, to wrap us up. But uh, you had mentioned mentors. Is What role did a mentor play in you getting involved in, in advocacy and activism and avoiding burnout? And do you think that's something that everybody needs? I think it's a huge advantage. Uh, I definitely have very good mentors with the community organizations and the like. And just watching how they handle things, they've been involved forever. Um, and uh, realizing that they could be cynical and a bit blasé but still completely committed mm -hmm. was, was very important that they had been doing these fights for a long time and they knew how little could change but how much each success actually meant to people uh, made a big difference and also how to actually accomplish the work you need to accomplish uh, and to look at the little areas you don't think about, like donors, like raising money for your organization. You want to be out there doing stuff, not trying to get cash, but, well, that cash means you can do a whole lot more. So, yeah, mentors are key. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think particularly on the question of burnout, like the mentors that I that I have cultivated, because um, I'm, not, I'm not really mentoring people yet, but uh, the mentors that I've cultivated there, you know, it, a lot of it is, a lot of them have great work-life balance, right? They're like, you know, I will always take a call from my kids no matter what meeting I'm in. I will leave at this time so that I can always make it to, you know, to home for dinner. Um, I think really watching them set those boundaries for themselves has been really important. And then because they're, you know, they're more experienced than I am, then it makes me feel comfortable doing it. So I would certainly in advocacy, if people are in positions of power, I would really suggest like modeling the sort of work-life balance, attention to mental health that you want everybody in the organization to have, because it really does send a powerful signal and a powerful message all the, all the way through the organization. In one sentence, what's something you would want somebody to take away from today's panel? Hmm. Keep working with others. Those other people will be, as Haley said, the best treasure you will get out of the adventure. And uh, they will uh, fuel you not only now, but in causes you don't even know you're going to be involved with in 10 years. People have followed me from group to group and organization to organization and are still doing amazing work by my side. Yeah. And I would say don't focus on your batting average. I think that's really important. <laughs> Wins and losses are not as black and white as they feel, but don't, don't, so don't let that trip you up. And we hit the 3.30 mark. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Happy Dragon Con! Before you leave the Hilton, remember hey, to rate. get in the app, rate, rate the panel, uh, leave nice comments. Uh, you don't necessarily have to leave five-star rating, but I would suggest it. Um, you know, it, it would make us all feel better. Uh, not that they tell us those things, but we would all feel better. So <laughs> thank you all for being here, and um, have safe trip home. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. See you all next year.